as the 4th of July weekend approached. My friends and I were excited about our plan to spend it at an isolated cabin on a remote island. There were about 12 of us. We wanted to get away from the noise and enjoy some quality time together. But the entire trip was extremely creepy. I mean, doors slamming shut like someone was messing with us, strange noises echoing throughout the woods, and what I thought were people whispering when we were out in the woods at night. We were all on high alert for the entire trip. It was feeling like we were in some horror movie. At first, we thought it was just John, our prankster buddy, trying to mess with us. But this time, things got way too intense. It was like someone or something else was playing mind games with us, but I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to make people panic more than they already were. A lot of concern came out of the things that had gone on. For instance, with the slamming doors, it wasn't just a gentle breeze or some faulty hinges. It was like they were being forcefully slammed shut. But the whispers, those I couldn't handle, those were the worst. It's like they were right there, right behind us. But when we turned around, there was nothing, just darkness and silence. It messed with our heads, making us question our sanity. We couldn't ignore it anymore. It was time to confront John to call him out on his pranks. We were all tense, ready to give him a piece of our minds. But when we saw the fear in his eyes, the genuine confusion, we realized something wasn't right and it wasn't him. This was about a week into the trip. That night, as we settled into our sleeping bags, the tension was high. We were all on edge, waiting for something to happen again. Eventually, everyone fell asleep, except for me, and that's when I heard it. A noise coming from the kitchen, like footsteps on the creaky floor. I couldn't just ignore it like I did with everything else, so I had to check on it. I cautiously made my way up to the kitchen, heart pounding in my chest. And there it was, this shadowy figure in all black, wearing a rough, heavyweight coat, something to resemble close to a Carhartt jacket. My scream rang through the house, waking up the rest of the guys. But by the time they got there, the intruder was gone. We all started freaking out, pointing fingers, blaming each other. The tension exploded into a full-on fight. Accusations were thrown left and right, and it felt like the group was falling apart. We were scared and confused, and fear made us turn against each other. But eventually, we realized that we were all in the same boat. We gathered our stuff in a hurry, desperately trying to make sense of what was happening. As we left to search for whoever it was, we found footsteps leading away from the cabin and a duffel bag left behind with a small axe inside. That's when we knew it was real. This wasn't just some elaborate prank from someone in the group. Somebody wanted to hurt us. The fight had shaken us, but it also brought us closer, which is weird how men operate like that. The next day, we drove into town and started asking around if anybody had heard about similar break-ins or creepy stuff happening in the area. We thought maybe there were other stories or things that could help us figure out what had happened. We went from shop to shop, bar to bar, talking to the locals and sharing our wild experience. But nobody seemed to know what we were talking about. We got weird looks, shrugged shoulders, and confused expressions. We ended up being literally the only ones that had experienced this. We even went to the local police station, hoping they might have some information or reports of strange incidents, and we handed in the axe as evidence. But they didn't have a clue either. The cops were just as clueless as everyone else. It was frustrating. We couldn't find any solid leads or anyone who had experienced anything remotely similar. Eventually, we had to accept the fact that we might never get the answers we were seeking. It was a bitter pill to swallow. This happened a long time ago, when I was younger. It was the summer of 1980, and our neighborhood was buzzing with excitement. Everyone was throwing a 4th of July gathering to welcome the newcomers of our newly renovating houses, including me. As I walked into the backyard, the scent of grilled burgers filled the air, and the chatter of people was so relaxing it felt like a nostalgic summer. I spotted a group of people laughing and talking near the drinks table, so I decided to join in to try to meet some of my new neighbors. That's when I saw him, the creepy guy who, I kid you not, not only gave off the vibes, but looked similar to how Jeffrey Dahmer did in that Netflix series. He was standing on the outskirts of the group, observing everyone with this awful grin on his face. I couldn't help but to stare and keep my eyes on him for my own safety, but his stare was so intense and I couldn't focus. I decided to change my idea of him and not judge a book by its cover, so I approached him, hoping to break the ice. 
Hey there, enjoying the party? I asked, trying to sound casual. He turned his head slowly, his eyes locking onto mine. His gaze was intense and very cold. Oh yes, he replied with a low, chilling voice. There's something truly special about gatherings like these, isn't there? So much potential, so much energy. I was absolutely weirded out at this point by his answer, but for my own safety, I acted normal and forced a smile. Yes, it's a great opportunity to meet new people and have a good time. I'm Sarah, by the way. Instantly, I realized a shift in his energy towards me. Sarah, huh? A lovely name for a lovely girl like you. Feeling increasingly uncomfortable, I decided to change the subject. So, are you new to the neighborhood? He chuckled softly. Oh, my dear. I've been around for a while, observing, studying, waiting. At this point, I was done with this conversation and started questioning things. What did he mean by waiting? Waiting for what? There was something seriously wrong with this guy. Thankfully, our conversation was cut short as someone called for attention to start the barbecue. People dispersed. Throughout the evening, I noticed the creepy guy lurking around, always watching, never truly engaging with anyone else. It was like he was fixated on me. Later, when I found myself alone in the basement, searching for frozen hot dogs to get for the grill, I heard footsteps approaching. My heart raced, knowing deep down that it was him. And there he was, standing at the bottom of the stairs. His face had this weird look to it, like one of the happy but sad drama clown masks. The best way I could describe it is that he finally got what he wanted, and every moment away from physically grabbing me was torture for him. Terrified at this point, I didn't know what to do, and my fight or flight kicked in. I grabbed the closest object next to me, which was a broomstick next to the dryer. I gripped the broomstick tightly, ready to defend myself. He started walking closer without saying a word, and I swung the broomstick at him, but he dodged it effortlessly. Panic set in, and I rushed out of the basement, screaming for help at the top of my lungs. As we all rushed back inside, frantically searching for any sign of the creepy guy, he had vanished without a trace. It was as if he was never there. Everyone thought I was crazy at this point. After the incident at the barbecue gathering, I decided to talk to the person who owned the property. I wanted to figure out if they knew anything about the creepy guy who had showed up that day. I explained what happened, describing the man's appearance and the strange things that he did. The property owner looked surprised and concerned. He told me that he never sold the house to someone who matched the description I gave. In fact, there hadn't been any recent sales in the neighborhood besides the already bought houses. It meant that the creepy guy didn't actually live there. He was an outsider who had somehow infiltrated our gathering. It was the 4th of July weekend, and three of us, Sarah, Emily, and Mark, decided to go on a camping trip to get away from the city. We wanted to enjoy the peace and quiet of the wilderness. We found a spot to set up our tent in a secluded area surrounded by tall trees. The trees rustled in the wind, and the overall vibe was very beautiful the entire day we spent adventuring. When the nighttime came, we started a campfire and sat around it, telling stories and enjoying the night sky full of stars. It was a calm and relaxing atmosphere. There wasn't a single strange thing about this place, which is why the rest of the night took us by surprise. We decided to end our night in our sleeping bags and get some rest as we had been driving for almost 24 hours straight. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, we heard a rustling sound outside of our tent. We unzipped the tent and were surprised to see a young boy standing there. He looked out of place in the wilderness. His face was pale, as if he'd seen a ghost, and he was dressed in fancy clothes, not something you'd wear for camping. It was like he'd come straight from a golf course. His hair was slicked back, and his pants were brightly colored. The boy spoke in a formal and serious manner, which creeped us out even more. It felt like he was playing a prank, pretending to be a kid, but acting much older. He said strange things that made us uncomfortable. We couldn't understand why a kid would be out in the woods alone at this time of night, especially dressed like he was. Mark, being the skeptical one, didn't buy into the boy's act. He told him to stop with the ghost stuff and reminded him that we were here to enjoy nature, not to get scared. The boy's expression changed and he gave us a smile. Oh, but there's more to these woods than meets the eye. Secrets hidden in the trees, stories whispered in the wind. Be careful of what you can't see. 
This made Mark even more angry, as he hated when people would overcomplicate things like this kid did, and Mark threatened him to leave or else. Sarah, her voice trembling, asked the boy, Who are you? How did you find us here? This isn't a place for kids. The boy laughed and said, Names don't matter, my friend. I've been wandering in these woods for a long time, unseen by anyone. But here we are, at the crossroads of something special. Are you a ghost? Emily stuttered. The boy laughed again. You know, you are kind of stupid for an older person. Of course I'm not a ghost. This isn't a fairy tale. As he laughed uncontrollably. We didn't know what to make of it. Was this boy really a ghost, or just someone pretending to be? The line between reality and supernatural felt blurry, and we were stuck in the middle of it. With another smile on his face, the boy said, Follow me. I know a spot where you can fish. Not many people know about it. My personality was super confused by his random request to show us a dumb fishing spot, but Mark, being an avid fisherman, sounded very interested. He couldn't resist the temptation. His curiosity got the better of him. Begging us to come with, we all stood up, ready to follow the kid. Suddenly, without warning, the boy broke into a dead sprint. We called out to him, but he didn't respond. We struggled to keep up, but no matter how fast we ran, we couldn't catch up with him. We searched frantically, calling out his name, but there was no trace of him. Completely exhausted, we made our way back to the campsite. We sat down, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Emily whispered, her voice filled with a mix of awe and fear. Do you think he was a ghost? Sarah shook her head, her voice trembling. I don't know. It's all so strange. Maybe he was just messing with us. Mark remained silent, lost in his thoughts. He had hoped to find the secret fishing spot, but instead, he found himself angry at the kid again. A few days later, we decided to talk to the park rangers about our encounter. When we told them about the boy, they were in disbelief. They informed us that five years ago, a family came to the same campground and their young son went missing. Despite intensive searches, he was never found.